This is Pivot Perspectives with Chris O'Byrne, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and relevant people on the planet. Hear their stories and get the most important business lessons they've learned on their road to success and get exclusive access on how to implement their success into your life and business. Pivot Perspectives is brought to you by the Strategic Advisor Board and your host, Chris O'Byrne. Henry Beeman, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. I would like to start with your military history. So how old were you when you went in and why did you decide to go into the army? Sure. So I have to start a little bit before, uh, in the high school time frame. I was, I'd always wanted to serve my country and be a part of the military. I'd originally thought that I was going to go to the Naval Academy, study aeronautical engineering and fly fighter jets. That was something that a friend of my father's had done, and I'd set my mind on that, and that's what I was going to do. And so getting close towards the, the end of high school, I had the appointment, I was ready to go, but my father was diagnosed with kidney cancer. And so I oh, wow. called up the senator and said, you can give that appointment to somebody else. And I decided to stay close to home. I uh, went to Clemson University, Go Tigers, in South Carolina. And was able to be there with my dad during those last few years of his life. The good Lord's call on my life to redirect me and show me what I was supposed to be doing. Um, because I, the hospice nurses and the nursing team that took care of my father were incredible. What could have been the worst time of my life actually really changed my life and shaped my future in the way that I uh, carried out the rest of my, my career. Because I changed my major and immediately applied to the nursing program and never looked back. And so I did Army ROTC at Clemson University and right out of college went into the Army as an orthotrauma nurse. And throughout that experience, I worked oh, wow. as the lead trauma nurse at Walter Reed in D.C. Uh, in the orthotrauma wounded warrior ward. Uh, I was one of the charge nurses on that ward and taking care of men and women who've sacrificed quite a lot for our country. And that really gave me a sense of what it means to serve. Yeah. Yeah. How did that shape your, I guess, your thought processes for what came next? So that experience and taking care of those men and women, first of all, my hat off to my hats off to those men and women who've given so much for our country. And I think our veterans every single day, even though I'm one of them, uh, it's because of the men and women who've sacrificed for our country that we're able to have the freedoms that we do have. And I learned from that experience yeah. how to express and understand empathy. Because as I left that position, I moved into leadership. And before I finished my time in the Army, I was leading 350 healthcare providers spread across four states. And really, connecting with my patients on a one-on-one -on -one level as a bedside nurse, I got to understand the struggles that people go through, how to empathize with people, how to connect and build a resilient team, even in a time frame when things are not going as planned. One of the big things that happened a couple of years back is the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure everyone's familiar with that, unfortunately. Um, during that time frame is when I was leading those 350 healthcare providers across the entire Southeast. And we were charged, my particular unit was charged with keeping what is now known as Fort Moore, Georgia, open for the basic training pipeline. So we had to provide leadership from the healthcare perspective and care from the healthcare perspective to 14,000 new trainees every week. And so that meant 14,000 COVID swabs a week keeping the mechanism of the entire U.S. Army training pipeline medically ready to keep moving forward. So got a lot of hands-on experience in a direct leadership role, which translated well into the recruiting force. Uh, as I left that command, I went to go take over a unit uh, recruiting still in the Southeast. That's what brought me to Mississippi. And from that experience became the number one recruiting officer uh, in the healthcare sector for the entire U S army. Oh, wow. Now, 
why did you decide to switch from nursing to recruiting? So from the nursing perspective, I had been moving up the ladder. I had gotten to see everything from the emergency room to inpatient care to a clinic to then managing multiple clinics across a multi-site location. The only piece of that healthcare sector that I hadn't experienced was in bringing in new talent. And I knew that was one of the things that we always talked about is staffing. What does it look like to to have a good and well-staffed unit? And from a nursing perspective, there's all kinds of different opinions. And then you see the struggles of hospital administration trying to, one, engage and retain talent, but also acquire new talent and bring folks on. Uh, our entire healthcare sector in the United States has really felt this churning of, of nurse burnout, of provider burnout, and bringing new folks into that fold. And that was something that I felt like I had an opportunity to shape and influence. So from the military perspective, those men and women that I took care of up in DC as a wounded warrior ortho trauma nurse, they deserve the best care that they can get. And if recruiting is a challenge, I wanted to put myself in that challenge and figure out how to get the correct healthcare providers at the right time to the right folks. So you purposely chose to round out your experience and kind of just master the whole realm. Uh, that's pretty interesting. Now, when you got out of the military, well, first of all, what caused you to, you know, move out of the military? And then what was that transition like into what you're doing now? Absolutely. So as I was leaving the military, I had decided that it was time for my family to settle and develop roots here in Mississippi. I have two young girls and they're going in, into the school age and working through that with them. I wanted to be able to provide them some stability. So I did transition from active duty into the Mississippi Army National Guard. And so I'm still continuing to serve to this day. But what I really found is I found an opportunity to give back and I wanted to give back both to the civilian sector as well as to the military sector. So that's what led me to found my company, Military Recruiting Solutions and the Beeman Group to provide recruiting services and training to both corporate commission based recruiters as well as the government and help them establish tools, tips and techniques to exceed their mission. Okay, so you, how long have you been doing that now? So I left active duty almost a year ago. It was in the end of March of last year, so 2023. So this has been a wild roller coaster and a short period of time. <laughs> so what is it that makes your recruiting company different or even better than others? Absolutely. The thing that sets us apart is number one, experience, and number two is the focus on outcomes. So many folks want to focus on the process and how to get there, and our focus starts on the outcomes. And in order to have an outcome-driven process, it starts with, with three things, attitudes, belief, and commitment. Uh, there's a quote by Jim Rohn that says, if you don't like your lifestyle, look at your outcomes. If you don't like your outcomes, look at your actions. If you don't like your actions, look at your attitude. And if you don't like your attitude, look at your beliefs or your philosophy. And so when you look at that quote, action, the place where most people focus is in the middle of the pyramid. It's in the middle of the process change. And you can't start changing actions without changing those predisposed attitudes and beliefs and commitment ahead of time. So I call it the ABCs. So start with the ABCs, your attitude, beliefs, and actions. Uh, you say that, you know, mindset is your attitude and your beliefs mixed together. Well, a positive attitude and positive self-belief equals success. Now, tell me more about your association with Jeffrey Gittimer, because it sounds like that's a pretty interesting story. <laughs> Yes, sir. So absolutely. So as I was leaving the the military, 
one of my daily discipline tasks is I complete a workout early in the morning and I listen to an audio book, something to, to better myself, to spark creativity and get my mind pumping. And I was listening to one of Jeffrey's books on audiobook, and I'd remembered when I came into the recruiting world, I had picked up his little red book on selling and used those techniques to influence the way that I recruited, the way that I approached the process of recruiting, very similarly to sales. And as I was listening to this this book, it's called Get Shit Done on audiobook, I thought, you know what? I should reach out to him. So I did. I, I called Jeffrey up and got on a Zoom call, much like we are today, and explained I'm a military veteran. I served as a recruiter for the healthcare force in the U.S. Army and ended up as the number one healthcare recruiter in the country based on using your techniques and molding that to fit the military model. Would you be interested in partnering me to help solve some of the challenges that the military is facing right now? And he absolutely was all in. So he picked up his laptop and turned it to show me his father's casket flag draped, unfurled down the spiral staircase in his home. And he said, both my father and my mother served. I'm all in. Let's do it. Wow. So you so sold the seller. <laughs> Absolutely. Sold the king of sales on making yes. a difference for our troops and for our military. So Jeffrey and I have partnered together with Military Recruiting Solutions. So, so when we talk about experience, it's the, the experience in recruiting that I've had and been very successful with. And we're also combining that with the absolute best experience and training from the corporate sales world as well. So when you work with military recruiting solutions, you get the best of both worlds. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me a little bit more about what, you know, specifically is uh, Jeffrey bringing to the table? What does he provide when somebody is working with you? Absolutely. So Jeffrey and I, both partner together to provide training solutions to corporations and to the military. Um, we have a complete digital library of a course curriculum. Our primary curriculum we call the Recruiter Fundamentals Bootcamp, and it is a one-week course that's laid out over a week. It starts with assessments and go, builds through the curriculum and ends with a live training, either in person or on webinar. And it is designed to take an entire recruiting force across an entire organization and flip the script and flip their mindset, giving them the attitudes, beliefs, and commitments, as well as the correct language and messaging to affect the folks that they're working with and to really resonate in today's world. The big thing that we've seen in a shift is a similar stuff to what Jeffrey talks about in sales is the shift away from cold outreach and building inbound leads. So that's something that we harp a lot on is how to build inbound leads versus cold outreach. And the secondary piece that we talk about is messaging and the language of recruiting and how to build that value message so that your potential leads, your potential clients, see you as a place of value and as a place where they will be successful. What are some of those key strategies that you use for building inbound leads? Absolutely. Well, one of them is exactly what we're doing right here, right? <laughs> getting onto a podcast, uh, getting articles written about you. So one of the things that I do is I write a monthly column in the Mississippi Business Journal. Mm -hmm. There are ways that recruiters can provide value to their audience which first of all, you have to determine who your audience is. Where's your niche? Who is your audience? Determine that audience and then provide value to them up front. This whole paradigm of value added after the fact is gone. You don't add value. You give value up front. Give that yeah. value up front and folks are going to seek you out and find you and say, hey, I see that you're an expert in this area. And they loop you into their network as a trusted advisor. And that's the place where you want to be. When you've established trust and you've established that you have value to give, you're a dead set for getting inbound leads. Got it. What's the process then that you use for military recruiting? 
Absolutely. It, I mean, I'm assuming it's part of it is getting on podcasts, but what, what else do you focus on specifically for your company? Sure. So that's something that both corporate recruiters and military recruiters can do is to draw inbound leads, right? So anybody, no matter where the field is that you're recruiting from, you want to draw inbound leads. The key thing is just that, finding out who your audience is and what they value. So a military recruiter, for example, their key audience is high school students, those bound to go to college or to get a job or whatever it may be. They're looking for that next step in life. And so what is the intersection between where they are now and where they want to be? Well, your services that you offer as a military branch, whether you be an active component, reserve component, National Guard, Army, Navy, or Air Force, or Marine Corps, it doesn't matter. What is it that you offer within your sphere that's going to take the individual from where they are now to where they want to be? And that's the value that you can add. So looking at a young man or woman that's considering going to college after high school, well, what can you offer them within the military services? They all have the Montgomery GI Bill. Different ones have federal tuition assistance. The active component looks a little different than the reserve component. So sussing out where it is and where your tools that you can bring to that table are figure out what that value is and figure out how to deliver that and deliver that messaging in a way that resonates early. That's what we help folks do. Mm, I like that. So along the way, both military and as an entrepreneur and a business owner, what are some of the lessons that you've learned? So the very first lesson that I have to share that I've learned that I think is the most important is it doesn't matter what job you're in. Every job is a people job. Mm. And what I mean by that is talent, the people that you work with or work for are what are going to make or break an organization. People don't leave an organization because the work is too hard. They leave an organization because of bad leadership and poor management. So as an individual, whether you're an employee or a leader, you have to be focused on honing your strengths and the strengths of those around you. Mm, yeah, that's something most people, I would say a lot of business owners don't even think about. Absolutely. And that's a, a key thing is I always, the, the military has a mantra that says, uh, people first, mission always. And yes. I say people always, mission always. Yeah, and yeah, it's hard. The, the key to is, is those. it's those, it's hard to separate and you can do both. And it's the people that are going to accomplish your mission, whether you're a corporation trying to take care of patients, like in a, in a hospital system, whether you're a recruiting agency that's trying to staff other companies. It's your people that are going to accomplish your mission and increase the bottom line and move revenue. So the training tools and development that you invest in your people are going to get returned tenfold, if not a hundredfold. Yeah, uh, so true. Uh, who are some, let's just say, uh, mentors or influencers that have been important to you along the way? So it's kind of funny. A lot of my folks that I have resounded and got a lot of advice and, and things from are dead people. Uh, the writings of a hundred <laughs> years ago. <laughs> and it's, it blows my mind. So I'm a big bookie. If you could see the rest of this bookshelf back behind me, it's packed with things. Uh, like He Can Who Thinks He Can by Orson Sweat Martin. The original founder of Success Magazine. A hundred plus oh, years ago, almost 120 years ago, Orson Sweat Martin wrote a quote, all kids should be taught to expect success in his book. Think the Dale Carnegie's, Napoleon Hill's, yeah. those kinds of folks, the classics. Um, and one of my favorites is actually one that's probably a, a lot lesser known. And it's a guy by the name of Albert Hubbard. And he wrote a pamphlet called A Message to Garcia. 
And a message to Garcia was written about a young army lieutenant called Andrew Rowan, who was charged by the president to carry a message to Garcia, a general located on the island of Cuba. And he doesn't ask how, he doesn't ask why, he just goes and executes. And it's really interesting because uh, Hubbard was a self-declared socialist and wasn't super thrilled about the capitalist society. But then he writes this book, this pamphlet about Lieutenant Andrew Rowan, who didn't ask questions. He just went and did what he was told to do and figured out how to accomplish it. And so it's a, a really kind of comical heard about uh, this. account, but it's an incredible story. And it's an incredible account of what having some drive and inspiration can do for you. Yeah. Oh man. It carries you a long way, if not all the way. I'm, I'm glad you brought up those books and especially the older books. Um, and, I mean, so many people, I guess, negate the value of older books, not realizing that they're just people are just coming along and sort of, you know, you have new authors who have been uh, right. trained and learned from these older books and these older people and then just put out a new book. And people are like, oh, what a great new idea this is. And it's like, <laughs> nope. There's it's no not, new idea. Years old. <laughs> uh, yep, at least. It's so funny. Um, so that's a great segue. Uh, I want to hear more about your book. What's it called and what's it about? Yes, so I just released a book called Live Inspired, Awakening Your Path to Purpose. And this is a quick, easy to read, almost workbook style, because there's lots of room in the margins and different places for you to write in and work through this this process of finding your own inspiration. Uh, the big questions that I ask are, what inspires you? What is your source of inspiration? And what are you going to do about it? And how are you going to leave this world a better place? And tapping into those three big questions, I help folks work through those questions, find their unique answers because it's different for everyone, and go out and live out their dreams. So I wrote this book for someone like myself as I was transitioning out of the military we're at a solid stable nine to five or nine to nine if it's the military <laughs> work and lifestyle uh, to move into living my own dream and living my own adventure and where am I finding the inspiration to do that what am I tapping into when things get hard and what's going to keep me from quitting and pushing that forward so that's was kind of my mindset when I sat down to write this book and so it was designed for individuals that are looking to take that next step, whether it's adding something on to their current career, whether they're switching careers, whether they're starting their own thing, or maybe it's just something that they want to do in their volunteer or spare time. Um, the book is all about tapping into what inspires you and having the courage to go after and chase it. So for people who are contemplating writing their own book, what was that process like? How long did it take for you? So I don't know if this is a usual case or not, uh, but I sat down with this book with an intention in mind and that I was going to have it ready for the new year. And this was in late October of 23. And I decided that that's late October. We're getting ready to roll into the holidays. And there's no better time to write a book about inspiration than with the start of the new year. And everyone wants to set resolutions. Yeah. So I was like, that's when I want it to come out. So I was a little bit delayed. It didn't come out at the, the first of the year, but in the month of January, you made it in January. And so I sat down and it really took a lot of hustle and grind. There were, were nights where I was up until midnight, one o'clock in the morning and back up at six o'clock the next day. But that's the thing about inspiration, right? When you're inspired to do something and you have a, an idea and a goal and you're inspired to do it, that, that source of energy just flows in and you can create so much potential without feeling worn out and tired and drugged down because you're really tapping into something bigger than yourself. And that was my drive and, and my calling to, to do this and to, to put something in people's hands. And so I was excited to do that. So it took about two months to do two and a half ish. 
uh, months. And the, the first process of it is writing the first word. That's the hardest part. Uh, and getting that first little bit done, letting it flow. And I'm a big fan of voice to text because stream of consciousness, you can produce a lot of good results. And too, too many times when we're typing it out, we try to slow down and analyze it and tweak it and make it better. Um, but really what you need to do is you need to let your thoughts flow and get everything down on paper, start that process, and then come back and tweak and make the changes. If you think of a uh, a big production movie, I, the immediate thing that comes to mind is Pixar. Uh, I read Ed Catmull's book, Creativity, Inc., and thinking of their process, there's entire movies that end up on the cutting room floor. And it all starts as this really rough project. And what makes a good movie is how much you cut out of it. Not how much you created and how much you put in it, but it's what you cut out. And so it's always better, in my mind, to start with more, write as much as you can, create a good solid outline and go back in and fill those bullets in, even stream of consciousness, as much detail as you can, and then come back and do the editing and the refining process and you'll come up with a really good product. So digging into the uh, the technical aspects a little bit, so you recorded it yourself, and then did you send it to somebody to transcribe, or did you do the transcription? No. This, this thing right here, hey, Siri, write this. <laughs> yep. Add it in a note. And boom, 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 boom. The Apple, sorry to rep Apple products, but sorry if you have a, an Android. <laughs> but <laughs> nope, Siri, Siri did the initial writing of my thoughts and putting it down. Siri's not great on grammar, uh, maybe with a little bit of a Southern dialect in there too. <laughs> it doesn't help things. <laughs> may have been a few y'alls, but uh, going back and readdressing that and fixing it as I tweaked and edited was, was key. But just that initial way to grasp my thoughts. Cause that's one of the things that's so daunting to so many writers is how in the world am I going to sit down and write 30,000 words and put it on paper and where's it, how's this going to work for me? And that's going to take a long time. And it does, it does take a long time. But if you start with a technique like that, uh, just using the dictate on your phone Using There's a software called Dragon Dictate that's really great. Uh, I've used that in the medical space. We use that frequently in medical documentation. Uh, it's great for doing book transcripts as well. But just getting yourself that starting space and freeing yourself up from it, that's a great way to at least get your starting point, come back, refine, and work a little bit more as you're going into it. Mm, yeah. Did you then hire out any of the other pieces, like the editing or the design? So, like uh, we had mentioned before we came on online, was uh, my wife is a, a high school teacher. And so I, my wife was my primary editor and, and went through that piece of it with me. Um, for content editing and those sorts of things, I... I had a little bit of, of an ace in the hole with my, my buddy, Jeffrey Gittimer, the best-selling author of over 15 books. So he and I sat down and, and reviewed that content together. And I really pulled my mentor team and mentor circle together for content mm -hmm. review and looking through how does the book flow? What does this look like? Uh, and we worked through those pieces together and really created the final product. So there was... Not a whole lot of, I have to hire out all these different folks. Um, that's part of that, that mindset that if you have those resources available, use those. Use the people in your circle. Writing a book does not have to be this big, scary thing that it once was. Um, and I've got a couple more on the back burner that, that are moving forward, uh, as, as we're speaking now. So I'm excited to, to continue oh. publishing and continue down this journey. This is just kind of that first foray into the writing space. But I, I highly encourage folks that are, that are interested in writing to keep a log of ideas. So that's one of the best things that I do also in my daily disciplines is as an idea pops in my head, 
I write it down or ask Siri to write it down immediately and keep it logged in in a note so that as I'm going through and it's time to write, even if it's just content for a LinkedIn post, I'm scrolling back through my ideas that I've kept or something pops into my head of, hey, I need to talk about this. And for instance, one of the things you'll see pop up on my LinkedIn, it'll probably air before this episode uh, comes out. But there will be a a post on my LinkedIn of a conversation that I had with a coach about finding pain points and the way they brought it up and finding people's pain kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And I I had a lot of thoughts about it. So I voiced them out there and put them in my note and went back and they've been edited and it's a scheduled LinkedIn post now, (laughs) which, by the way, don't find the pain, create opportunities. (laughs) Yes. Smart. Is that posted on LinkedIn already, or is that coming up soon? No, it's it, it's yet to come. It hasn't hasn't posted as of today while we're speaking, but it's on a scheduled post. That's the other thing that I, I, I will see is folks will see my things popped up on, on LinkedIn or other platforms. You have to take accountability of your time, and you have to allocate your time in a way that works for you. The, the concepts of time management are... I, I think baloney, you can't manage time because it will manage you. You have to allocate time and yeah. set time aside to do the things that you need to do. So all of my social content, aside from commenting, when I comment on folks' things, that's me real and live time doing it. Uh, but all of my other stuff that I'm producing and putting out is scheduled. I set aside blocks of time when I have time to work on things. And then I schedule it so that it'll go out and I may do two days worth of content at a time. I may do a week's worth of content at a time. That's just based on, on my time allocation for that particular week. Excellent advice. So what are some parting words of wisdom that you have for us? Oh boy, that's a tough one. So the, the biggest thing that I would say is no matter what space you're in, whether it's the military space, a corporate recruiting space, a coaching space, a writing space, wherever you are, find your inspiration and be willing to do the work to go after and achieve it. What is it that you feel called to do? How can you make the lives of yourself and those around you and even the whole world? Some think it's a too big of a goal to change the world but it really only takes one drop in the ocean to create a ripple effect to change the entire world. And I I challenge you to do that. And what do you say to somebody who doesn't know what their passion is, what their, what their place is, who's still struggling to find that? I've got a great book on Amazon for 1995. It works (laughs) you right through the process on how to do it. (laughs) That is perfect. Uh, and it actually wasn't meant to be a setup, but uh, uh, it was a perfect setup because, yeah, exactly. It's I what just people went for it. You, so lobbed, you, you lobbed one out there and I swung at it. <laughs> so glad you did. Uh, because there are a lot of people, even older people, who are struggling with that very same thing. So it's good to know that, hey, this book for you, no matter where you're at, this book you're going to get something really good out of it and can potentially transform your life. Absolutely. And that's the entire goal is to transform lives and to, to bring folks one step closer to figuring out what it is that, that they want to do with their life. Whether you're, whether you're 13 or whether you're, you're 83. (laughs) Yep. I'm closer to one than the other. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, thanks so much for coming on today. Absolutely. It's been a true pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Pivot Perspectives with your host, Chris O'Byrne. Please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advice on the planet. Follow us on social media for updates, and we will see you on the next episode.